Chapter 20 Miracles And he died. He had always wondered if there was anything there or if they simply turned out the lights, and if it was possible to make a deal with someone to go back to his childhood, to the time before the war, to his mother who was still alive in an earth that was still alive. That would be a magnificent heaven. But the world after death hadn't turned out like that. The afterlife was the same way life had been, battened down tight, except maybe a little bit cleaner with freshly painted walls. If life was painted with linseed oil paint everywhere, then heaven and hell had to be exactly the same as that. Apart from the walls, there was a bed, with more beds standing beside it, made up and empty. Strange, he couldn't be the only one who had died and come here. There was a metal rod too, with a transparent bag full of some kind of liquid hanging on it. A rubber tube came, ran from the bag to Archim's arm, replacing his blood with some kind of junk. Hmm. He was alive, therefore. He raised his arm and clenched and unclenched his fingers. The arm wasn't tied. He moved his legs. They were free. He threw back the sheet and looked at himself, stark naked, bullet holes covered with plasters, white. Why had they done this to him? Who? He had moved his back and didn't feel anything. The bite marks from the whip had healed up a bit. He looked at the cigarette burns. The scabs had come off, leaving pink blotches. What happened? He started remembering. There were flowers with the backs of heads. There was a conversation with Sasha. There was a revolver in his hand. How had they foisted a bed on him instead of all that and dripped a substitute into him to replace his blood? He lowered his feet to the floor, then took hold of the rod as if it was a staff. Standing to his feet was strange. His head was swimming. Sounds twisted and bent. A square room, one door. Taking the staff with the false blood along, he hobbled on his stilts toward that door. He tugged on it. It was locked. He knocked. No answer. But out there on the other side of the door, life was going on. He heard the sound of voices filtered through plywood. Music. Laughter. Laughter. Maybe it was heaven out there after all. He was in the antechamber. He just had to get rid of all this corrupted blood, replace it with this colorless angelic fluid, and they let him in. An iron maggot appeared in the keyhole and started turning. He had been heard. Archim wondered what he could use to strike a blow, but he thought too long and missed his chance. A woman was standing in the doorway in a white coat, a neatly washed and ironed white coat, smiling at him. Well, there you are. And we were beginning to get worried. Worried? Archim asked cautiously. You? Of course. You were unconscious for a long time. How long? Oh, a week already. You're in the second week. At least I caught up on my sleep, said Archim, trying to look over her shoulder and spot what was being prepared for him in the corridor. I don't even know any longer what I'm going to do in the afterlife. Are you really in such a hurry? The woman shook her head. She was lovely, pale, freckless, copper eyes, hair gathered back, a smile, and you could see that she smiled often. Such a neatly delineated face. The doctor said a week or two, and I'd be moving on. Well, I'm a doctor too, and I wouldn't have been so categorical. What would you have been? Another maggot stirred in Archim's chest. Hope. Well, you received, in my view, a dose of five or six greys, when about two weeks before you were hospitalized, judging from your blood. Before I was hospitalized. If everything had been done more promptly, if we'd started on treatment immediately, I would have said that your chances were 50-50, and now I wouldn't like to mislead you. The results of therapy are quite good. Transfusions. You managed to select the right antibiotics. Antibiotics? Therapy? Archim narrowed his eyes. Well, and some other things. I think you can feel it for yourself. The sores are healing up. Anyway, it's nothing like a week. There's a good chance, a quite solid one, that you'll start to recover. Your body is responding well. Where are the antibiotics from? I beg your pardon. If you're concerned about the expiration date, I assure you. 
where am I? What is this? Is this Hansa? Hansa? The Hansa outside here? The circle line, you mean? Outside. Outside what? Where are you going? Stop! You have no trousers, by the way. He jostled her aside and squirmed his way out of the room. The corridor ran off, immensely long and strange looking, as if it had been built inside a tunnel. One wall was rounded, covered in tunnel liners, but not tunnel liners like the ones in the metro. Eaten away by rust, these were clean and covered in heavenly linseed oil paint. Everything clean and dry, long life light bulbs dangling down. What sort of place was this? Not a station. There weren't any stations like this. A little orchestra started playing somewhere, merrily and drunkenly. Where are we? It would seem rather strange if you set out to explore everything here with a bare backside, Archim. I suggest you go back to the ward. How do you know my name? It's written on your card. On my card? Then he remembered. He remembered how two years ago he sat in one of the fascist cages, waiting to be hanged early in the morning. He simply couldn't get to sleep. When he did fall asleep for a few minutes, his sneakily pitiful brain fed him a dream of escape. Hunter appeared, exterminated all Archim's enemies, and freed him. It's a pretty good dream, but the lousy part was having to wake up. Archim raised his hands and looked at them again. He wanted like hell to believe in this. The odds and the chance and the recovery. He thought he had already come to terms with death, but no. The moment he was promised another bit of life, enticed, he fell for it. But if it was a dream, then he didn't need any pants. He started walking forward toward the voices. At one spot on the wall suddenly disappeared to reveal a large space with a distant ceiling. Here he could see how everything was built, like a tunnel, but a gigantic tunnel, so high that it could be divided into three human-sized levels, and running up from the first of these levels was a broad formal stairway covered with red carpet runners. Hanging above the stairway was a globe, an incredible globe, with Little square mirrors glued all over it. Some kind of lighting device shone in the beam into the globe, and the reflected glimmers scattered around, like the bright spots of laser sights. The globe rotated with staggered digity, as if it was a planet, and the flecks of light drifted across the walls. A dashing, do-or-die music was coming from the upstairs, and that was where the people were laughing. The entire wall up above the stairway was covered by a huge banner, vibrant red, embroidered with gold. At the center of it was a crest, the globe of the earth in an interlaced frame, with a hammer and a sickle crossed above it, a familiar symbol to anyone who had been on the red line, and the jolly glimmers from the mirror globe crept across that too. Was he with the reds? Why would the reds nurse him back to health? A dream. I shall be obliged to call the guards, the lady doctor warned from somewhere behind him. Archim set his staff on the first step and moved up a bit closer to the music. His legs were rather weak, not fully pumped up. He waited, then conquered the next step. What was this place? Slowly, narrowing his eyes, he plodded upwards. An archway started moving into view. He could see a white ceiling in it, and light as bright as day. Then it surfaced from behind the steps, a hall, an immediate, an immense hall, a round, bluish-white dome, with a chandelier dangling from the ceiling like an explosion of glass. The floor was soft, covered by a single, continuous carpet with incredibly bright patterns. Just looking at them made him feel dizzy and sick. And there were tables and more tables, tables everywhere, round tables laid for a meal. The tablecloths were blotchy. They had once been white, too. Plates with leftover scraps, carafes half full with something ruby red, forks lying on the floor, and people scattered about. They had clustered round some tables, abandoning the others that they had already eaten empty. In some places they were embracing, with their foreheads set together, like Archim and the dying political prisoner in the tunnel, only not moved by grief, but by vodka. In the other places, they were conducting solemn conversations, strangely dressed, not with bare torsos under their jackets, but shirts, even though they were crumpled, and even ties, like in photos from before the war. As if he was invisible, Archim set out toward them across the soft carpet, 
bathing his feet in the wooden gra woolen grass. Someone looked up at him from a table with bleary surprise in his eyes, but he couldn't look for long and slumped back onto the complicated salads and half-drunk shot glasses. A ragged orchestra was blaring away on the little stage at the far end of the hall, and a pot-bellied, bandy-legged character was cavorting impetuously between the musicians to cack-handed applause from the nearest table. Archim? He stopped, spotted. Sit down, don't be shy. Well, you're not shy anyway, I can see that. The man was looking at him and smiling, dark hair and damp streaks across his forehead, swollen bags under his eyes with a tipsy glint in them, and a buttoned shirt with a balding hog, bright red in the face and hiccuping, sitting beside him. Alexei Vikselovich? Oh, you remember me too. I was looking for you. Well, here you are. You found me, Archim. This is Gennady Nikuotic. Gennady Nikuotic, Archim. The hog snorted. At this point, it occurred to Archim that he could cover his private parts. He suddenly started suspecting that this might not be a dream after all. The raving lunacy on all sides was beyond endurance, but in a dream, it wasn't possible to think about the fact that you were asleep and you had to wake up soon. That would wake you up immediately, wouldn't it? Archim sat down with his bare backside on a velvet chair and covered himself with a napkin. How could he interrogate Beslov in this situation? Where was his Nagant? What could he threaten Beslov with to make him tell the truth? A table knife? How did I end up here? He asked in order to avoid confessing about the dream. Your friend persuaded me, our mutual friend. What? Sasha? Sasha. She implored me exceedingly tearfully, and, you know, I'm soft-hearted by nature. Then I remembered you and how funny you are. We had quite a ball at that time. My foster brother, you might say. So my heart faltered. I did pick you up off your knees, after all. You... Do you remember anything? I think you'd overdone it with the worms. You were a bit woozy, but you coped well with all the assignments. How titillating. Archim crept a bit farther under the tablecloth. He suddenly felt very naked, shamefully, idiotically naked. Sasha asked this ghoul to save him. They were nursing Archim because Sasha had persuaded him. I don't want this. I don't need your charity handouts. Ah, oh, there you go again. You fought stoutly that time too. Under the influence of the worm, you were going to introduce global justice, especially when we chatted about Miller. You used up two of my cigarettes getting rid of that tattoo. Don't you remember anything at all? Where are we? Where am I right now? We... we are in a bunker. No, not your heroic bunker. Don't make those eyes at me. You know there are lots of these bunkers under Moscow. We picked one that's fairly decent, refurbished to Euro standard. The others are not so great. Some are flooded, and some you can't get into at all. The doors are so rusty. The lady doctor walked up, and she had the guards with her, smartly dressed in tunics, as if they'd come straight from a parade. They prepared to impose order onto Archim. Oh, come on, are you going to take him away from me immediately? Pesilov was upset. Let me talk to the man for a while. He probably has loads of questions. The lady doctor agreed and went away. Sasha got me in here, naked and helpless, and she saved him. Why, well, yes, the boy... Got the bad dose of radiation, she said, and he got it because all on his own, alone, he guessed all of your terrible secrets. He wanted very badly to go back up to the surface, and this is where it got him. He even captured the radio station in Balashika, cut out the jammers, appealed to the people, a hero, an admirable young man. She told you, you, had she betrayed him, given him away. It wasn't only her, my own sources too, I must confess. I underestimated you that first time. You were pretty far gone, of course. That's what I like. A little chat with one of the common people. Tell him just a little bit about the things, how they really are. And get the sniff of the smoke that starts rising from his brains. Many people here haven't been in the metro for years, but I'm curious. And then my job means I have to associate with people. Are we in Moscow? Of course we are. A bunker. Why? 
Why does it look so strange? Why are there banners? Soviet. I don't understand. Is the red line really controlled by Hansa? Or is it really Hansa that's controlled by the red line? What difference does it make? What? Archim frowned. The white wall was slipping away sideways and upwards. Well, is there any difference between the red line and Hansa? Veselov smiled like quicksand. And just you try finding ten differences between the Reds and the Fascists. I don't understand. That's alright. And I'm willing to explain why don't we take a little stroll here. Without trousers, of course. We would be rather... Oh, hey, waiter. A fidgety waiter with a bow tie, gray hair, and a mustache came scurrying over. Beslov ordered him to take off his trousers and shirt to dress his guest. Archem demanded his own clothes, but he was told everything had been burned. Then he agreed to take the black and white outfit, except the bow tie. The waiter stood to attention, with his little gray-haired stomach trembling. The lady doctor disconnected the angel's blood and sealed off the puncture hole in his arm with a plaster. Alexei Fikselovich got up and wiped his lips with a napkin. He cast off from the table. Most impressed, the poor told Archim in farewell. They set off exchanging greetings through the well-liquored, drowsy guests at the feast. Kondrad Vladimirich, Ivan Ivanovich, Andrei Okensovich, and all the other rest of them. Who are they? Who are these people? Splendid people, Besselov assured him. The very best. They reached the stairway. So, Alexei Fikselovich gestured around the space. There was a question. Why the Soviet symbolism? He replied, Previously, before everything happened, this was the premises of the Moscow Cold War Museum. A private museum, but it was located in a genuine government bunker from the time of that same Cold War. A former so-called SF, that is, a state facility. Somehow it was privatized, God knows how, during the turbulent 90s. It doesn't matter. Flooded, filthy, and abandoned. Because at that time it seemed to us that these bunkers would never be needed by anyone again. Then the new owners decorated it in according to their own nostalgic taste. All these banners, red stars, hammers and sickles, and so on and so forth. Basically hinting at the USSR, but... Nepman style. They refurbished the place superbly, for which we are very grateful. They took it with a wooden plow and left it with an atom, atom bomb, so to speak. They collected a curious exhibition of historical artifacts and started showing foreign tourists round. But when World War III happened, they were quickly reminded what SF stood for, and who was the real owner here, and who was just temporary placeholder. Because anyone who has been here naturally doesn't want to go to the genuine SFs. It's all rather dingy there, without any of this pizzazz. Private hands are private hands after all, and the style is majestic. It's breathtaking. You look at that banner, and you remember how our great power used to threaten the whole world. And we didn't change anything here. It's stylish and patriotic and snug. The glimmers from the mirror globe trickled the red banner and Kabul the, on the crest. But the red line, they drive people against machine guns under these flags right now at Comsmol Station. Yesterday, a week ago, a child was shot in my arms. Not mine, but... Well, what the fit, pray tell? That's nothing to do with us. It was you who forced Miller to give them the cartridges, wasn't it? Hansa, there I come small to Muskvin. Archim had finally woken up. In the first place, we are not Hansa. In the second place, we didn't force anyone. The cartridges are ours, and the order is merely an armored delivery service. Moskvin was entitled to compensation for the actions of the Reich, and what they do with the cartridges is a matter of their ethics. But on the other hand, we stopped the war, which, moreover, began not because of the way the system is set up in general, but as a result of Cretanous initiatives at the middle management level. The same as it happens as the time with your heroic bunker. Do you really want a civil war? At Comsmall Station, they used those cartridges to make mincemeat of all those people. Live people. Why are you trying to frighten me with war? People are there. They are starving. They're ready to storm machine guns. Can you imagine that? What that's like? 
Veselov stopped talking and remained silent until they got down the steps. But what can be done? We're trying to find a cure for the mushroom rot. We're trying pesticides, but there are certain natural processes, the ecology of the metro, so to speak. I suggest we should consider it the self-regulation of the population. But you stuff your belly here. You could get that impression, Veselov agreed, but it's stupid to think that the bigwits at Polis, or Moskvin, or Miller don't stuff their bellies. This is a matter of rendering to Kaiser. There aren't enough tin goods in the state reserves for anyone. That's the way the world's made. If I go out there and feed an unfortunate, a hungry little girl with scraps from my plate, that won't change anything. My scraps aren't Jesus' fishes. Even so, I do go out and I feed hungry little girl. And nothing changes. Because your Hansa is no better than the Reich. And I tell you that, in essence, Hansa is the Reich. What? Catch up with me. Archim hobbled after him. From the staircase with the banner, they turned to the right. A bright red star shone over their heads. A sign glowed crimson. Bunker 42. There was enough electricity for all of this. All this was important. They walked through the corridor and came to an empty bar. The counter was illuminated by a Kalashnikov rifle woven out of neon tubes. There was no barman, and the open bottles pro offered themselves. Besselov pulled over something with a label that wasn't Russian, tugged down the spongy cork with his teeth, and put his lips to the bottle. He offered Archim some, but Archim declined fastidiously. And so, the Cold War Museum, said Besselov, turning to a narrow passage sheets of steel attached with square rivets. They walked into the museum space, an old map on the wall, laid up from below, an immense crimson shadow across half the world, signed USSR, gray little European states huddled up against each other, everything dotted with the stamped silhouettes of missiles and wide-winged planes, a pale mannequin standing in the corner dressed in an old uniform, a stupid summer uniform, guarding a huge fat bomb painted in gray linseed oil paint. Here we have an amusing little exhibit, a model of the first atomic bomb developed and produced in the Soviet Union. The bomb had a glass cap set in its nose, as if to allow people to glance into hell. But of course, there's nothing in there, just some kind of device with indicators. Darchim wasn't looking at it, he was looking at the huge map of Europe. It's all you, isn't it? The jammers are yours. I was looking for you, just for that reason. What's it all needed for? What are we all doing stuck here, in the metro, as the whole world survived. Did it really survive? Besselov raised his eyebrows in surprise. Well, all right, all right, it survived that got you there. All those missiles and planes on the map, that's all old stuff, right? It even still says USSR, not Russia. How old is this map? A hundred years? There aren't any enemies after all, right? Those enemies that Miller's afraid of, the ones these jammers are here for. The war ended back then, right? It's all very subjective, aren't you? Perhaps for some time. Some, it's still going on. They're not planning the West to do anything to us, right? Go and pull the wool over Miller's eyes with that one. If everyone believes what's most convenient for him. Then what's it for? The jammers. What did you put them up for? Why kill people coming from other cities to make it... Look like the whole world was bombed to pieces. What for? To make it look like we're all alone? And why are we stuck here in the metro? Because, said Alexei Fikselovich, shedding all the playfulness like a viper shedding its skin, outside the metro we will no longer be a people. We will stop being a great nation. What? I'll try to explain that too. And you stop yelling and try to listen. And by the way, we didn't put up the jammers. They're old, from Soviet times. What quality? In the 90s, they were simply rented out to businessmen to broadcast music, temporarily. The old waiter's outfit hung loose and baggy on Archim. Somewhere behind him, a security guard harumped and indicated his presence. Alexei Fikselovich took a handkerchief with initials on the corner out of his breast pocket, ran it over the bomb, wiping off the dust. But I think we'll start with this beauty here. Why do you want this thing here? 
Archie felt disgusted, it's as if Besselov was kissing a dead person on the lips. Oh, come on now. No one needs to know one's roots. Besselov turned toward him and smiled. And so we don't touch anything at all here. This bomb isn't the primogenitor of our sovereignty. Alexei Fyodorovich stroked the bomb's immense paunch. Essentially, it's only thanks to this that we're able to defend ourselves against encroachments from the West, to defend our unique social order, our civilization. If our scientists had not created it, the country would have been brought to its knees after the Second World War. Well, and after that, so that in World War III we could get hit with it and... World War III, Alexei Fyodorovich interrupted. In number three, we got a bit carried away, to got up, so to speak, in our own television truth. Man is good at that sort of thing in general, at substituting illusion for reality, in giving, living in the world with complete make-believe, a useful quality in principle. The entire metro, for instance, manages quite splendidly in this system of imaginary coordinates. The entire metro manages quite splendidly, Archer asked, moving close to him. What I mean is that everything works, everyone is drawn in, involved. On the red line, they believe they are fighting Hansa and the fascists. The people on the Reich believe they are battling against Reds and the Freaks. The people in Hansa frighten their children with Moskvin and inform their neighbors as Red spies, as if it's all really existed. As if... I was there? Archim suddenly felt he couldn't breathe in this museum. I was in the tunnel between Pushkin and Kuznetsky most. That bloody slaughter between the Reds and the Fascists baited dozens of people into fighting. Real. Life people. They hacked each other to death there with pickaxes and knives. Metal bars. That really happened. You got that? It really happened. I sympathize, but what does that prove? Who was killed there? Reds? Fascists? No, a certain number of genetically damaged individuals on one side, and a certain number of saboteurs and blabbermouths on the other. A controlled conflict and highly original mode of autopurification, if you can take a detached view of it. As if our system was a living organism, cells that hinder survival die off and peel away. But let me repeat, we did not start that war. The mid-level command of the Reich's intelligence service attacked the Red Line in order to curry favor with the leadership. Without having even the slightest idea that neither the Red Line nor the Reich actually exist. What do you mean, they don't exist? Well, that is, of course they exist. The names exist. It's very important for people to call themselves something, to believe that they are someone. It's very important to them to fight against someone. And we accommodate them. They don't have a totally totalitarian state here and we offer them the widest possible product range if you want to massacre freaks the iron legion is recruiting if you're dreaming of free rations and a common cause run to the red line if you don't believe in anything and just want to do business immigrate to hansa are you an intellectual fantasize about the emerald city and wear a hole in the seat of your pants in polis a convenient system you see Already tried to din that into your head back at Svetnoy Boulevard. Why do you want to go up on top? We can provide you with freedom here. What do you want with the surface? Alexey Fyodorovich stopped at the way out, ran his glance around the bomb's shrine, and turned out the light. Archim was still thinking how to answer. So you're not from Hansa. All this isn't Hansa. From what Hansa? Veselov shook his head. I told you. There isn't any Hansa, all right? There is the golden cir the circle line, and there are people who think that they live in Hansa. Where are you from then? Why, from here. Alexey Fyodorovich raised his eyes to the vaulted ceiling, assembled out of tunnel liners. From this very place, to be even more precise, from that room over there. Catch up with me. They came out to a little room with a parquet floor in desk with a green lamp burning on it, a security post. A sentry on duty, wearing an officer's uniform, got up and saluted. Someone's reception area. Escalator steps leading up to the next inter intermediate level of replica. It was like a room from a different time, not from the pretentious 2000s, but from times that seemed to be ancient, but had never actually ticked by in reality. 
They walked up the steps, and there was a door, an office, bookshelves with glass doors crammed with weighty volumes, and dolls or podium in the middle of the room, and a nomenclatura desk in the corner, like Svendlops or Miller's, a man sitting at the desk, motionless, lounging back and looking up at the ceiling, eyes with a plastic glitter, and a tunic with gold stars on gold shoulder straps, a bushy black mustache, hair combed across the head. That's Joseph Vesarovich. Delightful, isn't he? Stalin. A life-size dummy of Stalin. Wax, you can take a look. Tangled up in his dream, Archim obediently stepped up onto the podium. Stalin had put his boneless hands on the desk. A pen protruded out of one waxy fist, as if the dummy leader was about to sign some decree. The other hand was spread out on his flat palm, with the fingers extended forward. Below the mustache was a smile, carved out with a knife. Unwavering, beside his hand lay unfading rag roses. Unable to resist, Archim touched Stalin on the nose. Stalin couldn't care less. He couldn't care less that he had died and been resurrected. Couldn't care less that now he was a dummy, that he had escaped at such a price when the world had been reduced to dust. Couldn't care less that if they laid flowers at his feet or tweaked his nose. Stalin was in an excellent mood. Everything was fine as far as Stalin was concerned. As large as life, huh? said Besselov. See, from the museum too, an exhibit. Archim walked over to a bookcase, raked the dust off the glass with his finger, and looked at the shelves. They were crammed with one and the same book, repeated in a nonsensical number of times. Printed on the spine of every one was J.V. Stalin, Collected Works, Volume 1. What's it for? Archim looked around at Besselov. Stalin's office was here when it was a genuine bunker. Although the guides say that Stalin never did spend any time in here. He passed away before the facility was commissioned, but they made an effigy for the western tourists and licked the office into shape. Stalin was already here when we moved into the bunker, and we preserve everything. One must respect the history of one's people. Alexei Fikselovich clambered up into the dyes, moved over to Stalin, sat down on Stalin's desk, and dangled his legs. Continuity. There he is, and here we are. It turns out, as it were, that he built this bunker for us. He was thinking of our future, a great leader. Apart from the mustache portraits on the red line, Archim hadn't encountered Stalin before. What did he feel when he touched the great leader on the nose? Wax. Why continuity? The continuity is on the red line. Archim, come on, Archim, Besselov tut tutted. Let me spoon feed you then. The red line, Hansa, the Reich, they're dummies too, of course. They simulate independence, competition, and struggle. They even actually fight when they get carried away. So who are you then? Alexei Fikselovich chuckled. It's an elegant sort of thing, a multi party system, like a Hydra. Choose a head that suits you and fight the other heads. Believe that an enemy head is a dragon, conquer it. But what about the heart? Besselov stroked the desk and gestured round the office with his chin. This is the heart. You can't see it and you don't know a thing about it. And if I hadn't shown it to you, you would have carried on fighting against a head. If not the red line, then Hansa. Archie moved away from the bookcase and walked up close to Besselov. Won't you regret that you ever showed me? Besselov didn't back away or move aside. He wasn't afraid of Archim, as if he wasn't in Archim's dream. But Archim was in his. Go and tell someone that you are here, even that Miller of yours. What will he say to you? He'll say it's sheer lunacy. Archim gulped. Had he really confessed that too in his drunken state? Why hasn't he been here? Of course not. Why well, let everyone in here? This is a temple, a sanctuary. What about me? What about you? You're a holy fool, Archim. God's fools can enter the temple. They are even shown miracles. Suddenly it clicked. The invisible observers. Louder. The invisible observers? There now, look at that. You're not so hopeless after all. But that's just a tall story, a myth like the Emerald City. Precisely, Besslav agreed. A tall story, a fairy tale. 
Everything collapsed ages and ages ago. It didn't even hold up for a month, the state. And then there was chaos, and since then, everybody knows that. The children know it. No one governs us. We're all on our own, alone. The invisible observers are a myth. But how do you know that they're a myth? We were the ones who told you that. Do you understand? We immediately gave you a ready-made image that you could fit us into. You're a simple soul after all. You think with your heart, not your head. In images, well, all right, I'll spoon out the cliches for you. Help yourself, the invisible observers, hoopla. On the other hand, you definitely don't believe in me. But on the other, it's as if you already know everything about me. Rumors, better than television. But you, the previous leaders, that is, the government, the president, you were evacuated beyond the Urals, weren't you? The system of government fell apart, the state. Just think about it. Why would we move beyond the Urals? Why would we move to some separate bunker at the far end of the world, out in the cold, all, our, all on our own? What would we do there? Eat each other? Our place is with the people. He stretched, looking like a well-fed cat. And where were you all the time? When we were eating shit. When we were throttling each other. We were dying up there, on top, because of you. Where were you? Right beside you. We were always beside you, just on the other side of the wall. That, that can't be possible. I told you it works. You can't booze away real skill. Veselov got down off the desk and took a pull at his amber-colored bottle. What are we doing stuck in here? Come on, I'll show you how we live. Rather ascertainly, by the way. So you won't go getting any ideas. He carefully hoisted up the slumping Stalin and stepped down off the podium. Archim lingered, glutted with all this knowledge. You're bastards. But what did we do? Alexei Pigselovich asked. On the contrary, minimal intervention. We are merely observers and invisible ones at that. Only if the system starts keeling over, then we have to straighten it up. The system, people are so hungry they eat their own children. So what? Veselov shot the hostile glance at Archim. We are not the only ones who like... We are not the ones who like to eat your children. You're the ones who like doing that. And we don't like the fact that you eat your own children. We just like governing you. But if we want to govern you, we are obliged to allow you to eat your own children. Lies. You're stuck in here. And you keep us here. You treat people like pigs. Stool pigeons everywhere. Some have a security service. Some have the KGB. Some have... There are Sphenolopes everywhere. It's true, there's no difference between the Reich and all the rest. And that's because a Russian man can't be managed any other way, Veslov replied sternly. That is the way nature made him. Loosen the screws a bit and you get rebellion. He needs constant watching. What was all that business of yours at Constable Station? Look at them. They demanded their rights. They rebelled. How did it all end? In a bloodbath. Has that undermined the red line? Not in the least. Why, the security services are a god-given gift to our Russian man. He's right, just by nature. Those machine guns of yours, why, they pressed up as close as they could to the machine guns, jostling into the front row. But the patient one survived. At least that's some kind of selection process. And how else can our man be governed? He has to be distracted all the time, restrained, canaled, so to speak. He needs to have some kind of idea fostered onto him. Religion or ideology. He needs to have enemies invented for him all the time. He can't live without enemies. He's completely lost without them. He can't define himself. He knows nothing about himself. We had really excellent enemies in reserve two years ago. The Dark Ones. You couldn't possibly invent a better external threat than them. They scrabbled about on the surface. They were coal black without even any whites in their eyes, like devils. And they filled our Russian men with horror and loathing. Wonderful enemies, everything's clear immediately. If they're black, then we're white. We were saving them for a rainy day, the threat to mankind scenario. But no, some imbecile appeared and wound up that old fool from the order. And they went and bombarded our pet devils with missiles in their own safari park. Can you imagine that? Yes. We tried to intervene via the Council of Polis. We hinted that there weren't any danger from the Dark Ones as yet, 
basically the scenario just got bogged down. We had to domesticate that miller of yours too. I'd chop hands off for initiatives at the local level. If we had the dictatorship, are you coming? Shell shocked and crushed, Archim plodded after Besselov. They walked past the sentry, who jumped up again and saluted. But when they found themselves in a narrow passage, with their steps echoing hollowly on an iron floor, they passed the turnoff where the restaurant was located. A bright glimmer from the mirror globes darted straight into Archim's eye. The globe was spinning like Archim's head. Once there was a broad sheet of mirror, and a reflection of the whole world fitted into it. But the mirror had been smashed into smithereens and glued into hell knows what. Now they were lashing at it with a searchlight for the amusement and beauty of it. They passed the turn and carried on. How did you get a grip on him? How did you get a grip on all of them? Archim asked obtusely. Did you buy them? Mosfin and the Fuhrer. Well, now I can't generalize about that. There's a right approach to every man. Moskin, Moskvin values money, and he poisoned his cousin. And Yevgeny Petrovich, for instance, has a little daughter growing up with no fingers. She was born like that, a sentimental man. He passed all those laws about the fight against deformity, and he can't observe them himself. And we send him some photos. Here you are, Yevgeny Petrovich, and here's your little daughter in your arms, and your wife beside you, so there can't be any doubt, so play by, play by the rules, and play with gusto, because your citizens have to believe you, that even a single one of your very lousiest citizens must doubt that your Reich is absolutely the most authentic of Reichs. He must be prepared to give his life for the Reich. There isn't any Reich any longer. It gobbled itself up, digested itself, and shat itself out, and your fear bolted, and we'll bring him back and plant him there again, and we'll arrange a new Reich for him, better than the previous one. We've already picked up his wife and daughter, and the Fuhrer will be reeled in. Why do that? He's an absolute monster. Because, you droll little man, we are accustomed to working with Yevgeny Petrovich, and we know how to do it. The incriminating evidence hasn't been disclosed yet. Why should we look for a new man, find out about his weaknesses, lure him with the bait, and sink in the hook, when there's such wonderful, ready-made option? He messed things up, it's true, we'll, we'll penalize him for that. Where would we be without the Reich? They're all scumbags there, animals. Some are animals, and some are cowards. The animals aren't only there, but right throughout the metro, and look what a wonderful, beautiful enclosure has been built for them. And the animals crawl into it themselves from all over, the Iron Legion and so on and so forth, to fight the freaks, to let off steam. If there's no Reich, where will they go to? Think about the people. No, let them go and fight for the Reich, or for the Red Line, or for the Order. Choose what suits your taste. Freedom. There it is. That's freedom. That's not what people need. Yes, it is. Precisely that. So they won't be bored. So they'll have something to keep themselves busy. So they'll have a choice. We have a genuine, self-sufficient world here underground. And we don't need any other world upon the surface. I need it. Well, so you need it, but no one else does. Maybe they have family up there. If only for that, at least. Their families are all here now. And really and truly, I can't understand you. All you did was damage your health. They barely managed to revive you, you little fool. What is it you're looking for up there? We were born on the surface. Our place is up there, in the open air. You breathe differently up there. You think differently. There aren't enough directions up there here for me. There's only forwards and backwards. I feel cramped here. Can you grasp that? Don't you feel that yourself? No, you know, it's quite the opposite for me. I feel dizzy outside. I immediately want to come back down into the bunker, into the coziness. Right, this is our accommodation block, little apartments. They turned a corner into an immense blind tunnel ten meters across that ran from one point to the middle of the ground to another point somewhere in the middle of the ground. How many more of them were there here? The passageway ran on farther. It was obviously late. The inhabitants of the bunker were straggling away, blousy and fuzzy from the snow-white drinking joint and creeping off home. Archim glanced around the door jams into one of the apartments lined up along the tunnel. 
then into another one. Yes, really quite cozy. Good enough for a human being. Why are you showing all this to me, saying all this? Well, you know, I enjoy it. A bit of argument. You're a revolutionary, aren't you? What were you doing, sitting there at Sasha's place, waiting for me? A romantic. Did you want to shoot me with your revolver? What? Did you think that if you killed me that it would straighten out people's lives? What do I do? I'm only in charge of domestic policy. Waste me, and a new head will grow. I tried to talk some sense into you back there at Svetnoy Boulevard, but you see, your memory has failed you. At Svetnoy. As I said, lots of memory. But that's not surprising, it's essentially symbiotic. This amnesia of yours is a blessing to us, of course. No one remembers anything. A people of ephemeral mayflies. It's as if yesterday never happened and no one wants to think about tomorrow. A single, continuous, present moment. What tomorrow? How can you plan tomorrow, when there's barely enough chow for today? And that's if you're one of the lucky ones. Now that's where our skill comes in. There should always be enough chow for today, and always just barely enough. An empty stomach brings dream about comprehensible things. One has to be able to keep a balance, let people stuff themselves, and they get indigestion, and their self-importance escalates. Under do the chow, and they smash the structures of power. Well, or what they understand by power. Will you drink or our skill with me? No. That's wrong. You should drink more. The salvation of the people lies in vodka, and it helps with the radiation, by the way. Thanks for the reminder. The pure alien blood crept through Archim's veins as viscously as gel, stinging and confusing him. Archim would have preferred to have his own thin, dirty, poisoned blood back. Anything not to be indebted to these scumbags, even if he only had one more week to live. At least he could burn out his own life and not parade about with a borrowed one. You talk like that about the people, but yourself, where are you from? Yes, it might have sounded as if I don't like the people or I despise them, but quite the contrary. My heart lies completely with them. I love them. Do you believe me? Look, I go out into the people like that get to know people and mingle with them, the way I got to know you, simply, loving the people. One has to understand everything about them, and one has to be honest, one mustn't delude oneself. Yes, that's what our people are like. One has to feel the kind of people one is governing. One has to love one's own people, one has to edify them. Catch the demons? You govern. Who governs? Eloy governs Morlocks, isn't it? Aren't you some kind of Aristocrat, then? Me? Beslov smiled. What sort of damned aristocrat am I? Their aristocracy were all shot way back when. I'm not even from Moscow. I started out as a TV journalist. The food wasn't so good, so I became a political technologist. And things spiraled up from there. So I'm bone of the bone and flesh of the flesh through and through. Archim had sudden realization. Let their gel flow through his veins. This was the very respite that would give him the time to do something. He looked around. There weren't so very many guards here. He had to walk through the entire bunker, of course. What if there was a military base in one of the tunnels? Who provided the force to back their power? What's over that way? Let's take a look, if you like. In the third tunnel, we have a storage depot. In the fourth, there's just standing bare and empty. The businessmen didn't get to it refurbished before the war, and we haven't had time to do it. What are you wondering? What's the smartest way you could grab all this from us? Beslov winked at him. I could take you on as an apprentice, if you like. You only have to ask. I don't think you've explained to me yet why I should hang around here. Don't you understand? It may be better or worse, but it's all under the ground, in the metro. What's the fucking point of that? When there's entire cities up on the surface, forests, fields, the ocean. They reached the end, an immense, empty tunnel flooded with rusty water, nowhere further to go. The pump droned, siphoning the phlegm out of his this throat. But how do you know what's up there, huh? Maybe it's all exactly the same as here, only without a ceiling. Well, so there's something on the radio. Does that give them paradise, freedom, fraternal love? Don't make me laugh. They wander across the surface of the earth. 
turning wild one by one without any authorities, without any state, forgetting how to read and how to write. I was talking to you about exceptionality. This is... it's this metro that makes us exceptional. 50,000 people in one place. Only with a concentration like that it's possible to preserve civilization and culture. Only in that way. Yes, in the metro. So what? Up there on the fresh air, they'll become brutalized more rapidly. They'll forget more rapidly what it means to be human up there. On the surface, there'll be Neanderthals, polygamist, Zuratus. But the people, the spiritual, rational people, will be here. Spiritual? And who eats their own children? Well, Robinson Crusoe didn't wean Friday off human flesh instantaneously. We simply don't try to rush things, but sooner or later. But why don't you let us choose for ourselves? Whether people live on the surface or under it, why didn't you ask us? We have asked, Veslov smiled. And we are still asking. We've got nothing to feed them with. There's the mushroom disease. Let them go. Then at least they won't starve to death here. Our great people have survived worse trials than this. They'll get by somehow. Do you know how hardy they are? It's fucking crazy. Let them go up there. At least give them a chance. Up there? Do you think there's a land flowing with milk and honey up there? You've been there, in Balashika, for instance. What is there for them to eat? They'll find a way to feed themselves. You bloody romantic. Why am I wasting my time on a fool like you? Well, let me go then. I didn't ask to be sca saved for people like you to... And what then? Do you think if I let you out, the entire metro will immediately rise up to support you? That you'll cast off, tell people the truth, and lead them up onto the surface? Everything there will be different from here. It will. Off you go then, Alexei Fikselovich said indifferently. Go ahead, I'll even give you back your revolutionary nagant. No one there will believe you, just as you didn't believe me. Do you realize at least that you'll simply be telling everyone the tale? of the invisible observers. Get real, Archim. Archim nodded. He smiled. We'll see about that. Thank you. That was chapter 20 of Metro 2035 titled Miracles. Thank you for listening, and good night.